Well, hello again, friends, and we want to welcome you to this special segment of Q&A. I know our Facebook friends have been sending in some Bible questions, and we've got quite a few that we're going to try to cover this evening. So, Pastor Doug, I guess we're ready for Bible questions. All right. Well, I, what, you want to tell me what the first one is? Yes. Well, let's see if we get that on the screen. They're probably working on that in the back, so we will go. Well, here we go. I think we might have a question coming up so that we can all read it. There it, there is. it is. And here's our first question for this evening. Where is the best place to start reading the Bible? Is there a particular book in the Bible that I should start with? Or should I just begin with Genesis and keep reading? Best place to start reading the Bible is wherever you happen to be. If that's at home. <laughs> if you're in church, you can read it there too. <laughs> but, um, you know... For me, and it varies, uh, I've got a lot of friends who say you should start with the New Testament. I used to work with a ministry that just sent New Testaments because they couldn't send the whole Bible. It was too heavy. And people found the Lord. Just Some just read through the Gospel of John. Uh, some of you have maybe a different favorite Gospel. But Gospel of John is a beautiful place. I liked reading Genesis 1 through 50 because so much of the New Testament refers back to the foundation you find in Genesis that it, when Jesus is talking about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Israel, you kind of get the picture of what the history is by having that foundation. Um, so you read maybe through Genesis and you go over to uh, read the Gospels up to Acts. You're getting the history. You're getting the, the story of salvation. You might back up then. You can read Exodus up until chapter 13. Then go and read Judges, First and Second Kings or first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, that will really give you a history of God's people. And then as you delve into the different prophecies, they're always referring to the history. So you get the context. So that works for me. I think it was Martin Luther who said, you should read the Bible the way you pick apples. First, just shake the whole tree. So then you shake the branches. Then you shake the limbs. Then you look behind every twig and leaf. So first get the general picture. Now, of course, Pastor Doug, last night you spoke about the Bible as being our foundation. So you'll notice a theme through these Bible questions sort of centered on the Bible and the importance of Scripture. How do we study the Scripture? Amen. So I think our next question deals with this a little bit. Uh, how do you share your faith with someone who believes that the Bible cannot be taken literally and that it contradicts science? Well, you need to convince them that the Bible is an accurate book and... Uh, I've always found that prophecy is an excellent way to do that. That's why so many pastors in Bible studies and evangelists, they go right to the prophecies because immediately you see that there's an accuracy in the Bible that is amazing. And you know, I can't explain it. Uh, Jesus said, the words I speak are spirit in their life. But as a person starts to read the Bible, I was an atheist. I started reading the Bible. I believed it was a collection of fables, but I thought, well, there's some spiritual benefit in it. You, know, you can learn from a fortune cookie, and that was my attitude. <laughs> I thought, well, I'll see what I'll learn. Reading the Bible transforms you. There's something different about it. There's an inherent power of the Spirit that attends people who read it. And so you might challenge your friend and say, oh, they don't think it's scientific. I say, well, have you read any of it? And people are often down on what they're not up on. Invite them. Say, well, would you be willing to study it with me? Would you take the challenge to read just the Gospel of Mark? Just read John. Give them something small. And watch how the Word of God does something on its own as they read. Okay, the next question that we have is, what is the best Bible version to use when doing Bible studies? Now, this might be giving somebody Bible studies, or mm -hmm. it might just be studying on your own. What Bible version? Well, it's, uh, first of all, I'm not an expert on all the different Bible versions, and it's, uh, it's kind of a subjective question. I'll tell you my preference. Um, you know, I, uh, when I first read the Bible in the cave, the first Bible I had was a King James Bible. But I honestly struggled in understanding it. So then, I, I, people always say, do you still have that Bible? I dropped it crossing the creek one day. And you know what happens to a Bible with onion skin pages when it gets wet? It just swole up and got stiff and you couldn't really use it anymore. I, so I was always sad about that. And so a friend gave me uh, a newer translation. I don't remember what it was. It may have even been the Good News Bible, which is a terrible translation. It's not even a translation. It's a paraphrase. But you know, God can even use coarse sandpaper. 
And I somehow got the gospel. I was reading through the New Testament while I ate banana bread every morning. And, um, but then I realized it wasn't very accurate as I compared it back with my King James. And so I then gravitated back to the King James personally. I spent years listening to Alexander Scorby read the King James Version in flawless English. And so even when someone wrote a note last night, they said, Pastor Doug, it says New King James up on the screen, but you're quoting the King James. I said, oh, good eye. So that's because I've memorized mostly the King James. And there's no book that's affected English language more internationally than the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, for its beauty, its poetry, its elegance. But there are other good translations. This happens to be a New King James Version. They've just basically updated some of the ancient words that aren't used as much. Like you say, shoe, wherewith, where and for. You know, some of the words have been updated. And so, um, some other good versions are the uh, New American Standard Version. I like the translations that are coming from the Textus Receptus. Uh, when you start to get some of the other modern translations, they take liberalities I'm uncomfortable with. You'll see whole sections of the Bible that are missing. Parts of Mark, the story of the woman caught in adultery in the Gospel of John. They say, oh, well, we couldn't find that in those manuscripts, and so they're willing to leave it out. I, I believe it was there. And I don't have time to go into a whole study on that. But Okay, very good. Next question that we have is, how do you answer someone who says that the Bible cannot be trusted because it contains contradictions like the story of the demoniacs? And that's the story that, of course, we have in the Gospels. Yeah, if you read in um, Mark and in Luke, it says there was one demoniac. If you read in Matthew, it says there were two demoniacs. And if you read the Spirit of Prophecy, she said there were two. Uh, one of them was the spokesman. He was out front. Another one was a little more in the background and didn't come forward. And so as the Gospel writers wrote about that, some said there were two, and there's other places. One place it says there was two blind men as he came out of Jericho. One says it was blind Bartimaeus. They both stories tell pretty much the same story. Probably one of them was doing all the talking, and so they mentioned his name. This strengthens my faith in the Bible. Because if the Gospel writers just copied everything from each other, why would they do that? But if they're giving their account of first-hand things they saw, they've got the freedom to say, well, Bartimaeus was yelling, Son of David, have mercy on me. Or there was this demoniac and only one of them spoke. And so they reported it that way. That doesn't shake my faith at all. Amen. Absolutely. Our next question that we have then is, some parts of the Bible are confusing to me. Is it okay to skip over those parts that are difficult to understand? Well, yeah, and then come back to them. <laughs> you know, when I'm learning a new language... I start with the simple words that you're going to need to get around in that country. I say things like, Donde esta el baño? <laughs> <laughs> you got to learn the basics, you know, or cuanta cuesta? <laughs> How much is this? And, but then as you spend more time, you, you say, I want to learn some more of the more difficult words in the conversation. When children are learning to talk, they first learn the basics of communication. And when you're reading the Bible and you say, I don't know what my father is saying to me, so start what you do understand. But you don't want to give up on everything else. Go back and keep digging deeper. The Bible is like a mine that fans out like a river. It gets deeper with veins and there's treasure everywhere. So you start, you get the stuff that's laying on the ground. And come back and start digging. But you, you want to understand all of it as much as you can in this life. We'll be studying the words of God through eternity. The next question that we have is, what do you mean when you say, and you might have mentioned this the other night, the Bible is a supernatural book? Yeah, well, I don't mean supernatural like in magic. I mean supernatural. Supernatural means that it is not normal. There's something that is miraculous about it. It's miraculous in the way it was preserved. It's miraculous in its message. It's miraculous in its power and what it does in our lives. That's all I meant by that. So, yeah, the, the Bible is not an ordinary book. It's a book that God has preserved in a supernatural way. Angels have been involved in preserving the Word of God. Holy Spirit is there as you read to bring the words to life. That's all I meant. You know, Pastor Doug, we have a radio program that we do once a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the beginning of the year, we always encourage folks to start a, some kind of a reading plan with their Bible. 
And uh, we know people are actually starting to do that because this is a question we typically get at the beginning of the year when people start reading through the book of Genesis. It's one that we've had before. It's a good question that people ask. Where did Cain get his wife if God only created Adam and Eve? He joined an online dating site. <laughs> Just... <laughs> no, he's right. We always, first of the year, people start reading through their Bible. And uh, right away that says, you know, there's Adam and Eve. Cain killed his brother, Abel. It says, and Cain took his wife. And they go, wait, whoa, wait. <laughs> Where'd she come from? <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, was there another family in the garden that had daughters and they didn't, just don't mention it? And uh, there's all kinds of interesting theories. The simple answer is that Adam and Eve, you read in Genesis 5, I believe it is, it says they not only had Cain and Abel and Seth and other sons, it says they had sons and daughters. It principally mentions the firstborn and it mentions Abel because one killed the other. But they, you know, they lived 900 years. God told them, be fruitful and multiply. I'm sure everything was working perfectly. And, you know, they just had gaggles of kids, probably. Uh, and so um, he married one of his sisters. You might think that sounds really weird. But Adam married his sister when you think about it. Didn't they have the same parents? It's even weirder. Adam married a girl who came out of his side. <laughs> so the, back then they were pure. Abraham married his half-sister. Jacob married his first cousin. Isaac married his first cousin. It wasn't really frowned upon until you get to the time of Moses, and we all know there's genetic problems that can appear if you marry too close to the family tree. And so there's nothing wrong in the Garden of Eden. God said, you know, their, their genes were perfect vitality, and they married their sisters. The next question that we have, could you please explain the verse in 2 Corinthians 5.8, which says, absent from the body, and to be present with the Lord. And you can jump in any time. Oh, yeah, right when we ahead. do our radio program it. together, we can kind of <laughs> answer the questions together. But I feel like I'm the mascot right now. You're doing great. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, this is a verse that's often quoted when it comes to the idea that you know, when a person dies, they immediately go to heaven. There'd be nothing wrong with looking at the verse that way when you think of it in this context. When a believer dies... To say their next conscious thought is the presence of the Lord, that's true. If you're a believer and you die, King David died, says he slept with his fathers. You go to the book of Acts chapter 2, Peter says David is dead and buried and he's not ascended to heaven, he's still with us. How many believe that David will be in the resurrection? Mm -hmm. So he'll be saved. So 3,000 years have gone by from now till David approximately. Does it seem like that to him? Or for David, when he dies, his next conscious thought is the resurrection and the presence of God. We're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So there's no problem with understanding that, but you die when you sleep. Now Paul in this whole passage is talking about a number of things. He's wanting to be with the church of Corinthians. He says, I can't be with you in body, but I'll be with you in spirit. And he said, the, you know, the Holy Spirit is going to be with you. And then you know, Paul talks about um, being absent from the body and present with the Lord. He also talks about not living in the flesh, but living in the spirit. And so these terms are often used a variety of ways there in the writings of Paul. But he's not saying, as soon as I die, I'm going to zip up to heaven and be with Jesus before the judgment and the resurrection. And that's the way some people use it. All right. Our next question is, does God say in the Bible that we must attend church? Yes. If you can. Why wouldn't you want to? If the church is the body of Christ, if part of the Sabbath commandment calls it a holy convocation, what does that mean? You convene. We come together to worship Him. If we are all parts of one body and we all have different gifts that don't really meet their fulfillment until we unite with the core of the body, you know, if you see an arm flopping around on the ground by itself, you realize it's not going to be nearly as effective, right? And so the idea that, well, you know, I'm religious and I love the Lord, I'm spiritual, but I don't want to go to church. Uh, I always worry as pastors when people say, uh, do I have to go to church? Why wouldn't you want to go to church? And so I do think that the Bible is pretty clear that we need to come together and worship him. In the Bible, it says they were breaking bread together from house to house. You don't have to just come to church on Sabbath. We ought to be coming. The church might be a home. 
But we ought to be gathering together with other believers for accountability, for spiritual encouragement. Amen? Mm -hmm. And you know, talking about that same verse, Pastor Dagan, Hebrews, Paul says, especially as you see the day approaching. Forsake not the assembling right. of yourselves together. Amen. And as we Good get point. closer to the second coming, we need to press together. And of course, that's Amen. gathering and worshiping. Next question that we have, what is the best way to get spiritual conversion started in the church or revival? Well, revival happens usually in the context of a response to the proclamation of the word. John the Baptist brought a revival. He was preaching the word. It comes in the response to prayer. If you want revival in the church, the church is a collection of people. It starts with individuals. And you can have a revival in your life as you start spending more time in the word. You spend more time in communion with God. If you do like Enoch and say, Lord, teach me what it means to walk with you, to talk with you, to be in conscious of your presence, and you'll experience the spirit in your life. Be inviting Christ into your heart all the time. We forget about God, and that's why it seems like, like dry bones. We, we need to just live in his presence. Amen? Amen. I think we've got time for two more questions. The next one, how can we know that the Bible hasn't been changed over the many years since it was originally written? Well, when you look, I think I shared last night, um, at the Dead Sea Scrolls, really our Exhibit A, um, that here after 2,000 years, you could look at the books that they had then, and you look at the Bible that you have in your hands, and um, uh, there's a study on this, but I think that someone came to the conclusion, of course, you know, that was in the original Hebrew or Aramaic, and you translate it to English, but looking at the original and looking at the Hebrew scriptures today, there's like a 99% or 98.5% accuracy. There's just a fraction of a percent of differences and really almost no difference that would change the meaning of the text. So God has miraculously preserved his word. And like I said, you're looking at uh, copies of the Bible 2,000 years old in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Absolutely. Our next question that we have, some older Bibles have other books included, such as the book of Maccabees. Are these books also inspired, and why are they not in all Bibles? Well, the consensus of the um, early church, by the time of the Apostle John and the contemporaries of the Apostle John, the books that you have in the New Testament were all accepted. Now they're asking a question about the, the Maccabees and you'll see some in a Catholic Bible in the Douay version you'll see some of the, what they call the apocryphal books and, uh, and Martin Luther actually had something to do with those books not being included the criteria they used is the books are not referred to by other Bible writers for instance Peter refers to Jude and Jude refers to Peter and Peter refers to Paul and you'll find there's like cross endorsement that's happening in the New Testament, in the New Testament, with the Old Testament. 10% of what Jesus said, he quotes from the Old Testament. So if Jesus is quoting from a book, you're pretty sure that it's inspired, right? So they used a very high criteria for developing the canon of Scripture that we have. There are some other books like Maccabees that have very interesting and in some cases probably accurate history. But an accurate history is not necessarily the inspired Word of God. And so I think that uh, we can trust that what we have here is that word, the scriptures. All right, our final question. Of course, the Bible says that the prophets wrote the scriptures. So the question is, will God raise up more prophets before Jesus comes? I believe yes. Um, the gift of prophecy is one of the gifts of the Spirit God gives to the church. It tells us in Joel chapter 2, it will come to pass after those days that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Old men will dream dreams. And so I think the same way during the former reign, God poured out the Spirit on the early church. Were the apostles also prophets? Were there other prophets like Agabus and, that you find in the New Testament? When God pours out His Spirit in the latter reign, in the last days, are we going to see less demonstration of power and the gifts of the Spirit? Or are we going to see a revival of those gifts mm -hmm. as that day approaches? How many of you are praying for that day to come soon? Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you again for all those joining us on Facebook. We thank you for all of the questions that you sent in. And please, right now, go ahead and post your question on the Facebook page. We're going to try and answer as many of those questions as we can tomorrow evening. 
And of course, to those of you here in the audience, thank you for staying by. If you want to ask a question, just go to the Amazing Facts Facebook page and you can post a question. We're going to try and answer as many as we can. So our next meeting is tomorrow, tomorrow evening. Tomorrow. You want to be here by 7 o'clock. If you want to come a little early, you can do that. We have some special music. John Lomacain, Kelly are here. So again, thank you. God bless. Hope to see you tomorrow. Amen. God bless.